Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Press Club. I'm Ken Foskett, and I chair your volunteer board of directors for the club. Uh, this evening's program, The Business of Climate Solutions, Local to Global, continues the Press Club's long and important role in fostering civic dialogue about the important issues of our day. Today, business leaders and journalists discuss sustainability and the actions Georgia businesses are taking to reduce their carbon footprints. On behalf of the Press Club's members, I would welcome to Georgia Tech President Angel Cabrera and Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian for a conversation with our moderators, Maria Saporta of the Supporter Report, and Nick Valencia from CNN. Welcome also to Georgia Tech faculty and staff here today, especially to university deans seated, seated in the first few rows. Thank you all for being here, including Atlanta Press Club board members and the many journalists in attendance today. This event would not be possible without our sponsors. Today, our 2022 Newsmaker Leadership title sponsor is Delta Airlines. Our presenting sponsor is uh, Drawdown Georgia, and our supporting sponsor is Southern Company Gas. We also recognize our friends from the recording these important discussions. If you would like to... If you would like to sponsor uh, the Atlanta Press Club, learn about our upcoming events, or join the club, please visit us at atlantapressclub.org. Please note that today's event is being live streamed on Facebook and will be available later on our YouTube channel. With that, I'd like to ask Quinny Jenkins, Director of Community Engagement from Delta Airlines, to come say a few words of welcome. Well, hello there. My name is Quinny Jenkins, and I am the Director of Community Our Climate. I'd first like to thank the Atlanta Press Club for having us here today. I'd also like to take the time to acknowledge our co-sponsors, Drawdown Georgia, Southern Company Gas, and Georgia Tech and the Ray Anderson Center for Sustainable Business. At Delta, we like to say that no one better connects the world, and that's exactly why we're here today, to connect with each other. I know I speak for so many of you when I say how wonderful it is to be back out in the world and to see, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's great to see so many smiling, familiar faces, and um, we understand that there's absolutely a conversation that's sure to leave us enlightened as well as empowered to work together towards climate solutions, both locally and globally. I do hope you're as excited as I am to hear directly from Georgia Tech President Angel Cabrera and Delta Airlines CEO, and my CEO, Ed Bastian, as both leaders are making a huge impact in the fight to save our planet, both here in Atlanta and across the world. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to our two moderators, Maria Saporta and Nick Valencia, to begin our discussion today. Enjoy. All right, thank you, Quinny. I'm Nick Valencia. I am a, let me fix my pant leg there. I'm a national correspondent here based in Atlanta for CNN, and I am a grateful member of the Atlanta Press Club. And just to you know, riff a little bit off of what Quinny said, it's so nice to see everybody's faces, well, a lot of people's faces here, and just to be back in the, in the world and feel a little bit of uh, normalcy here. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. When offered the opportunity to do this, I thought you know, this is one of the most important discussions of our time. Uh, as a father of two small children, I wanna make sure that I leave a, a good world here behind for my kids. And I know that uh, these individuals here are, are doing their part to, to make sure that the future generations have a world uh, to live in. Uh, today, we will discuss how both small and large businesses make positive changes to reduce pollution 
and uh, waste. We also learn about companies taking individual and collective actions to support Georgia's statewide goal of net. So that segment will come near the end of our program. And once again, please help us welcome Georgia Tech President Angel Cabrera and Delta CEO Ed Bastian, if you guys can please stand. And also, if you could welcome my co-moderator this evening, uh, a woman who doesn't really need any introduction here to a lot of people locally, Maria Supporta. She's a, a huge name in my family's household. My in-laws are huge, excuse me, huge fans of hers. Uh, thank you so much, Maria. If you can stand and uh, receive an applause here. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, I think I've gotten the honor of make, asking the first question, and it's to both of y'all. Uh, we're going to use airline lingo and take a 30,000 foot view of the world here. Um, the world is facing tremendous challenges from economic headwinds, conflict. Yes, I know we have so many good Delta customers and loyalists here, so thank you for your loyalty uh, to our brand. It's a, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, it wasn't. You know, anything in there that's not you know, shaping uh, the future and moving and is quite dynamic. Um, so I, I don't know that I could rank it. What I, what I can say is that we've just been through you know, the two years that this, our lifetime will never forget. It will be probably the most impactful time of our life. I think it will be some of the most defining uh, years of our, of our generation. And the one thing about the last two years that has left me, and I know many of us at Delta, is, is the, we, we've, we have felt very vulnerable uh, as we've had to build our business back and we've seen uh, that we can't take our, our wellness for granted or what well-being, the resiliency of what we do um, needs to be fortified. And when you're in a period of, and I don't think any of us have a, have a clue, and we could all speculate, but there's no question that, um, you know, this has impacted him, it's impacted the reason why they're, you know, they, they invade. I mean, there's, I think all these things have some level of, of inter, inter uh, relationship, but we can't walk out of this time frame without a renewed commitment to, re, to replenishing, you know, the earth, healing the earth, healing the planet, and creating that opportunity for, for next, uh, children going forward, all of our children going forward. Uh, President Cabrera, in your mind, how would you rank? Well, I, I think while we were all paying attention to um, what's happening in the eastern part of Europe, um, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued the latest report, didn't receive sufficient attention, but I encourage everybody to read it. It's sobering. It's scary. Um, the perils of climate change are not in the future, they're here now. In fact, I think one of the recommendations is that we stop talking about what may happen or... This is an existential question. I don't want to be over dramatic, but it is. I mean, whatever happens uh, to our climate, and it's an existential issue for, for our species, uh, should be one that, that really everybody should put at the top of their, 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 their list of, uh, of priorities to resolve. Now we're here because we've been amazingly successful. Right? We're, we're, we're here because we found uh, cheap ways to produce energy, smart ways to convert energy into new ways of transportation, uh, the industrial revolution that allowed us, um, first of all, it allowed us to, to grow to whatever, seven, eight billion, soon to be 10 billion people. It, uh, because we learned, um, it's having an interesting conversation with one of our colleagues yesterday who works in carbon capture. He says, you know, we learned to, to capture nitrogen from air and, and turn that into fertilizers and, and feed uh, 7 billion people. And we learned to do all these things and humanity has never lived this well. I mean, we've never lived this long, this healthy. We've never eaten this well. Uh, the number of people you know, living at poor levels have never been this low. So, so this is the result of our success. COVID, where we face this very scary, very sudden new disease, and within less than a year, we had figured out what caused it, we have figured out ways to prevent it, we have figured out ways to manufacture a vaccine and distribute it around the world, and all that was imperfect and noisy and drove us crazy at times, 
but we, the sort of global we, we got it done. Um, so time and time again, we've, humanity has figured out ways to. I'm optimistic because not only there are tons of smart people around the world, I actually happen to live with a whole bunch of them. Um, some of them are actually in this room. They're members of the National Academy of Science and Engineering. They're leaders in their fields. And, um, and they're not just brilliant engineers and scientists. They're brilliant uh, policy experts and, and economists. And, and we, we need all of that. We, we're going to need the best of our best thinking to figure out. We need, we need social scientists. We need people who figure out how to best communicate this. Um, remember the o ozone layer in the 70s? When we actually, that was pretty, pretty bad. I mean, we were um, really ruining this. We stopped producing those uh, substances that, that, that really um, were creating the problem, and, and we're in good shape now. So I'm, I'm going to ask a quick follow-up question. Sorry, and this quick. One might I got be, it quick. No, no, it's, it, that question may have been a little too complex. On this one, on a scale of 1 to 10, Please rank the degree of urgency that we're facing to address climate change. So I'll start with you, President. Ten. Ten. Okay. I mean, it's high. I don't know if it's a ten, but it's high. Okay. I, I feel that energy and that optimism from you, uh, President Cabrera, about the opportunity here for innovation and, and innovators. Can we talk about what types of innovation solutions are being presented here. I mean, I read a an, uh, New York Times article before coming here where there are plants that are being built that are literally sucking the carbon dioxide produced by planes and, and burying it deep underground. So I'd love you to expand on that. Well, I mean, there, there are big things, there are small things. By the way, what, what, in partnership with Delta, in which we helped Delta remove all the wiring from the entertainment systems and turn it into sort of a wireless. Think about just the the the, the the kilograms of, of material that we were able to remove from planes to increase efficiency of the planes. So again, a lot of innovation is not about, oh, let's all stop flying or stop living. No, it's, it's how can we be smart about doing this? I have colleagues in this room who are experts in combustion. They know all about you know, what kinds of fuels can work better, and renewable fuels, what kinds of combustion technology can, can be more, most of, effective and efficient. We have, we have experts here who are trying to figure out, again, how to capture carbon from the air and go and bury it back underground where it was to begin, to begin with. Um, we have uh, folks, po policy experts right here, I think they'll talk about it later, that, that are trying to figure out in a concrete space like Georgia, what would be the, the lowest hanging fruits in terms of activities that can be done here and now uh, to produce less, to eventually maybe remove. So it is, it is so exciting. And by the way, for those people who think that anything we do. Well, I, I certainly agree with Angel that the, we're just starting to get serious about the innovation that's coming. And every day you hear about new opportunities. Uh, I'll speak to my business and, and, and a broader scale. The, the bigger challenge I see is how are we going to fund this? You know, what's, what's the capital? We can come up with the ideas and the technologies, and it's, it's how do you scale it? Uh, Delta Airlines, we're a, we don't have an alternative right now to jet fuel. 98% of our footprint is, is fossil fuel, it's jet fuel. And we are classified as a hard to decarbonize industry. And yes, we're doing an awful lot of work, you know, working with Georgia Tech, working with many, uh, organizations and development firms and small they, they tend to, a lot of them tend to be fairly small uh, biofuels and you know renewables and how we're going to replace our energy source all the way up to hydrogen and, and beyond but uh, sustainable aviation fuel which is what we're very focused on at Delta if we acquired all the sustainable aviation fuel that exists in production today in the world it's enough to you know, cabinets in the administration to figure out how do we bring the energy producers to the table with an end consumer that's an airline. And when they produce this, they can produce sustainable aviation fuel. It costs us anywhere from three to five times a gallon to, to buy. We can't afford, we're just coming out of a pandemic. It's expensive. Right? And it's expensive already now with, because of what's happened. 
uh, with commodities. So we need the government to create the forum by which consumers, meaning airlines, can actually be a customer, the energy producers, which I don't blame them. They're not going to invest the billions, tens of billions of dollars required unless they know they're going to have somebody on the other side. Somebody's got to close that gap. Now, the good news is that we've already seen this in our country. We saw that with autos. And you look at the boom of EV now. And the reason why EV and Tesla and GM, everyone's doing because the government provided the incentives and the subsidies and still, still to this day do that to create the investment for the vehicle to be produced. And the commitments that are being taken on the ground are really impressive to get, I think, you know, fuels, other, other means to, to invest. We can't do it commercially right now. I'm going to follow up on that. Two years ago uh, in February, um, you, Delta announced a very ambitious $1 billion uh, plan to actually become the first carbon neutral um, airline in the world. And then COVID hit. And um, maybe you we got We got there the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> that probably helped reduce your carbon footprint right there when 95% of your planes were It's a bad flying. joke, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk about what you've been through in these past two years? You alluded to it before. And then um, tell us where y'all are at Delta in terms of living up to your commitment. Because yeah. so, it was within 10 years you wanted to become a... Uh, yeah, so we said within we want to be a carbon neutral airline. We we're willing to invest a billion dollars. That was the cost. And you know the only real vehicle we had at the time was, was the offsets market, which is controversial and... There's a lot of a lot of concern around the efficacy of carbon offset. We still went out and bought, and we spent a lot of time investing in certified offsets to create the the uh, the, the carbon neutral commitment. And we did the same thing in 2021, and I think that number is going to be in the 75 million dollar range. So even at these these uh, reduced levels of of flying, they're still pretty expensive. And what we've done is we've researched and we've gone all around the world to find the highest quality. And so we're investing in reforestation projects and clean water projects and in many other parts of the world where we can find. But it's, you know, the, 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 as many companies are now racing to net zero, the marketplace is, is very tight for that. And the cost of these offsets have tripled and quadrupled. And to try to find a certified uh, offset that you know is actually going to replenish uh, the, the world nature's way is getting harder and harder to find. So we're committed on the billion dollar investment. We're not backing off of that. We're gonna to need probably to find, and we always knew we'd need to find more ways to offset. It, with offsets alone are just a very immediate, short term, easy solution. We have to invest in the real technology and the real solutions, which is gonna probably be re, I don't know. Uh, she's not here. Uh, she came to us from General Motors and she led a lot of the electric vehicle development over at GM over the last 25 years, which is why I was attracted to her. Uh, she, she led the, the investment that GM made in cruise and the autonomous uh, vehicle uh, apparatus. And when, when I spoke to her, I said, I, I, need, I need you to do for us in the sky the way you did on the ground for GM. And now people are competing over which, which you know, uh, electric car you want. You know, so the the manufacturers are now designing product that consumers want to invest in at affordable price points with government support. And now they're into where, how you're going to create the batteries and how are you going to create the. Well, we need that those same. We can't use batteries to to operate our planes. Our planes are way too heavy. But we need to have that same race. And it's probably going to take 20 years to get there. But we're on the journey, and that's why I, uh, I reached out to Pam, and, and I've hired her. How, how uh, Pref uh, President Cabrera, how does the race see Anderson? It's a, a terrific partner because it is motivated by, uh, by a, a company and a company's leader who understood the role of business in tackling some of these big issues. And, and so it's a, it's a perfect alignment. It's not just obviously a, a, a generous sponsor that is, that is funding uh, critical efforts, but it is, it is a sponsor that is fully aligned with this mission and this, this vision that business has a key role to play and that business leaders have a huge role to play. 
And it all starts when a business leader says, this is important, and, and I'm gonna hire someone to lead the effort. And we don't know exactly where the solutions may be, and we know it's difficult. But you just heard CEO of one of the biggest airlines in the world saying, this is a huge deal, and we're gonna do our part to, to solve it. And I think that idea of how do we make sure that new generation of business leaders have and share that, that attitude. A lot of what, a lot of the solutions that we're gonna see coming forward are not just new technologies. It's not just the technology or the gadget, or it is the business model around that. All of these is, is not just, again, what happens in our labs, in, in, in aerospace engineering labs, or mechanical engineering, or in biology, and so on, but it's also what happens uh, in, the, in the business school, what happens in the policy school. Um, all of those, all of, I mean, we, if, by the way, if, if I asked you, all the, my colleagues who I'm seeing in this room right now, they're from absolutely every discipline represented. I'm interested in, in how government is involved in this. And you touched a little bit on the federal government and, and the necessity for them to be involved in this. Specific here to you know, the state level, this is a red state where some people may still deny that climate change exists, unfortunately. Uh, what kinds of political roadblocks are here for businesses? And in what ways have state laws challenged Delta in setting and reaching climate goals? Yeah, so we've focused our energy at the federal level because you can't do the, tackle this state by state. This is big, and this has to be almost seen as an international level. And uh, the good news for us is in the, uh, the, the, what's left of the Build Back Better agenda at the White House, all the way, but it's a great start. All right? and, we, and so we, we've got their ear, we've talked to the White House all the way through. We've talked to the Department of Energy and um, we've talked to transportation, all of, all of the cabinet agencies, and, and you've heard it, you've seen it, the, 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 this administration is very focused on moving towards a, a green future, but it's, it's expensive. And just it, doing it by mandate and forcing people to do it isn't gonna, isn't gonna be the answer. They gotta create coalition. And so we're, we're getting great reception, but you know, we're a divided country, so it's not the state as much as the, the federal level. Divided, so I'm hopeful that whatever remains of Build Back Better or what it gets turned into, there's still going to be capital there for us to get started. Because the, I've talked to the energy producers; they're willing to go, they're willing, they're willing to invest. And by the way, they already receive meaningful tax credits on renewable diesel and other products that are used on the ground. And so that's what we're competing with. They're going to make economic choices. If they can get a better deal, economic deal, to create renewable diesel to put in cars, they're not going to invest in my business. But government is not just good, but perhaps the only vehicle we have to create the right policy setting in which individuals, businesses, researchers, and others can come up with those solutions. And the levers that government has to enable that transformation are enormous. There is the research budget, where government injects hundreds of millions of, actually billions of dollars into places like Georgia Tech, about a billion two, billion three dollars. Most of that federal taxpayers' dollars come to this institution to help our scientists uh, to, to, to do the work. So that's one lever you have, pump resources into, into, into research that research uh, occasionally leads to commercially viable products. One of our colleagues, for example, um, Professor Gleb Yush, the consumer incentives, the fact that um, when, you, when, you, when you buy your, your Tesla or, I, uh, or I drive a Chevy Volt, by the way, they don't make it anymore. It's an amazing car, by the way. Uh, but also I benefited from that. So you create, government can create incentives. At some point, we're gonna to have to take, whether it's cap and trade or, or tax, and my economists, policy friends here will have very strong opinions one way or the other, but some of that is gonna to have to happen. That's gonna create incentives, that is going to create opportunities for people. So government plays a huge role. Now, when you read the, um, the, the, the latest IPCC um, report, it's a long report, but it has uh, chapters uh, for different regions. There, it has one chapter dedicated to North America. One of the 
critical issues that are highlighted there. One of the biggest barriers that we have, and it's explicitly pointed out, is the political polarization, which is delaying um, urgent action. So somehow we need to get over this. I mean, our nature, the atmosphere, our climate, that's where the, the action should be. That's where the debate should be. But I favor less government, more private initiative. Fine, I favor more. That's where I hope the action goes, because government and policy absolutely will play a humongous role in, in getting us out of this. Could, could, I, could I just add something to sure. Angel's good, good remarks? I also don't want you to think industry is not investing heavily in these solutions. I don't want to leave this at the footstep of government. We talked about fuels. That's, that's a classic example where we do need a government bridge and a coalition. But we're investing at Delta as well as you know, the other airlines, uh, Boeing, Airbus, General Electric, Pratt Whitney, Rolls Royce, tens and tens of billions of dollars a year on this topic in terms of new planes, new technology, new forms of propulsion, uh, hydrogen, new solutions, because these companies know, particularly the engine producers know, that he or she who gets it right is gonna have an incredibly uh, viable you know, alternative for, for the long term, and it's not the, the largest. That plane is replacing our 757s, which is a, about the same size in terms of number of seats, and we estimate that's going to be somewhere between 35 to 40 percent more fuel efficient wow. than the plane it's taking out. It's massive. We're investing. We're happy to invest in that technology. It's not built on sustainable aviation fuels, but it's making a big difference in the footprint. And every plane that we take, and this, this year we'll probably take about 75 new planes into our fleet, is coming about 20 to 25 percent on average more fuel efficient than the planes we retired. And because of the pandemic, we got rid of all of our really old equipment, the MD-80s and the MD-90s, which I know you'll, you'll, you'll miss, um, and uh, you know, some of the 717s and the 757s, 767s. But we actually got two years younger during COVID in terms of our overall fleet age, even two years later now. And that's huge efficiency, and that's huge energy. So, so we're, we're doing our part, and I don't want it to appear that this is a government issue, and we're, we're, we're helping. There's a lot of companies out there that are, that are selling them. Uh, a lot of announcements made, not a lot of actual activity in terms of, in terms of development. They're probably three to five years out. Candidly, they're called the electric VTOL. Uh, they're small planes. They're you know, three, four, five-seaters, ranging up to maybe a 18 to 20-seater plane. Uh, they're, they're really going to be used not for us to substitute, but it's for, for cars and congestion. So that, you know, probably less so in Atlanta, but more so you think LA or JFK, if you want to get from, from downtown Manhattan out to JFK in 10 minutes, you know, you can take this electric vehicle and fly there, a flying car almost, as compared to sitting in traffic for an hour and a half and all the, the value that's created around that. But that's coming. That's coming. And there's a lot of, a lot of companies chasing Sorry. that. And a lot of investment in SPACs have been, uh, have been developed off of that. So Delta is unique. It's one of the few airlines that owns its own oil refinery. Uh, you got into a little trouble, though, because uh, you're a member of some airline associations that have actually been lobbying against some of the very policies that you've been that we issued that was voluntary we just you know trying to set good governance and good transparency of some of the challenges we face uh, we do own an oil refinery it's uh, it's something that we bought 10 years ago when oil prices were through the roof well north of even where they are today mm -hmm. it was well over hundred dollars a barrel back then and all the oil refineries on the eastern coast of the United States were in the process of being closed uh, because it was too expensive to operate. And so we were in danger of actually losing fuel supply going up to the northeast, really critical you know, infrastructure to New York and Boston and the transatlantic. And this refinery had been closed. It was 100 years old. We reopened it. We've, we've done really well. I always get the question, do you, do you hedge fuel? You know, when fuel goes up and down and volatile, and we, we used to hedge fuel, but the reality is, you know, I probably shouldn't even be sitting in my job. I lost so much money. Uh, I'm amazed the board hasn't fired me yet, so I, I told them I'd stop about six or seven years ago. We haven't hedged fuel since. 
But the only real hedge you can have is actually you can produce and refine the product yourself. So we're not actually out you know, creating a footprint for a product we wouldn't buy. We'll glimpse into renewables and how do you start to re reallocate that know-how and, and, and start to create product you know, using new technologies and you have, a, you have somewhat of a greenfield. It's an old refinery, it's hard to call it greenfield, but that you can start to explore and invest in some of that capital we talked about to find different solutions to, uh, to create the uh, energy supply of tomorrow. So you say you disagree with the positions of the um, airline associations on this issue? It's not a topic that we're discussing or having a, a, an evaluation on. It's just that we have a, a different vantage point on, on the refinery. I think the issue you're probably talking about is around the renewable uh, fuel standards and RINs and ethanol, and we have to pay this, this higher tax burden because we can't uh, blend ethanol into the production of our, we don't have the capability or the, the, uh, the means to get that. So it's, a, it's really a relatively modest thing. How much of your oil consumption is from Russia? How much of the oil consumption comes from Russia? Uh, today, zero, I'm proud to say. <laughs> Russia. Uh, it was coming from Africa. It was coming from different parts of, of you know, over, over the Atlantic. And as soon as you know, we found out about this, as soon as I found out about it, we immediately, immediately, and we, had a, we have a bunch of open contracts, and I stopped them before the sanctions went into place. So, so it was done legally, but we, we didn't wait for the sanctions to go into place. Uh, President Cabrera, thank you for that. Uh, President Cabrera, I want to continue with you. This is a question scripted for you, Maria, so I hope I, I'm not stepping on your toes here, but I want to get you in here. Um, Drawdown Georgia. We're here to talk about Drawdown, uh, Draw, uh, Drawdown Georgia um, and the compact of uh, Georgia business that are seeking to reduce their carbon footprint, positively impact equity, economic development. So there are 20 proposed climate solutions listed on the website and a carbon reduction visualizer. Uh, can you tell the audience and myself in layman's terms, why understanding carbon impact is so important for businesses of all sizes, not just the big ones. So, climate change is not just a, when we talk about the sort of the global scale of the problem, sometimes it makes people uh, be different in different contexts because your economy mix is different in a place like Georgia, your population mix is different, your geography, the impact, so this is about both prevention but also building resilience and how you're going to react, understanding how, for example, sea level rise is gonna affect the coastal areas in, in Georgia, the, the effects are gonna be different in different regions. So with, this is an effort to bring this global problem close to home. And the same thing with the, with the business uh, compact is to make sure that everybody understands everybody has a role to play. Uh, that this is not something for us to lean back and for somebody else to fix. Everybody has a role to play. Um, and that, so when you go to the website, it's also trying to provide feedback so it, more immediately you know exactly, you can see the data, you can see are we making progress or are we not making progress, what are the actions that are available. So in a way, it's an invitation for everybody to, be, uh, to, to, to increase their agency. I feel like there was so much momentum with, with that young girl, Greta, are you finding it hard to restart that momentum at all about, you know, you saw four? So, yes, but, but I think there, hopefully there's some lessons from the pandemic uh, that can help us. And um, for example, the fact that, I mean, I don't want to trigger you, but if, if we rewind to two years ago, uh, back when we were washing the oranges from the grocery store and uh, leaving the, the, the Amazon boxes for 24 hours outside. Yeah, and, oh yeah. Uh, this was real and scary and, and, and we didn't know what was causing this disease and how was it was transmitted. Do you need a mask, you don't, whatever. Think about how we went from that and talk about an existential problem. This was scary, people were dying. This, we didn't understand this disease one year. I don't take any of this for granted, one year. And this was a global collaboration, by the way. These were scientists in China who sequenced the virus, who made that sequencing available immediately on the internet. Laboratories in Europe, in the United States, and other parts of the world, 
So to me, if there's anything we, we, we should learn from, we're smart people. We, 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 that's what science is, what this, that's what technology, and when we, when we faced a scary uh, circumstance of this, new, we were able to figure out the solutions to that problem. Um, if we did that, why not with, with climate change? So, so I, I honestly, I think that, that if anything, I hope that, that one of the lessons we get is, is, is an increased confidence and in, in, in belief in, in, in science and, and technology. Good. So um, you and I have run into each other almost literally on our bicycles um, <laughs> at Piedmont Park. Um, tell me what changes you have made in your life, and Ed, I'd love for you to also talk, what changes you've done in your life to, to actually try and reduce your carbon footprint? Right, I mean, there, listen, there are aspects of my job, they are what they are. I, I, I have to fly, I have to, that's a part of, of, of my job. But there are other things where, for example, I live, I live three miles from my office. I, um, most of the days I bike, I bike today, um, or, or I walk if I can. And by the way, that has had, I don't do that as a sacrifice, by the way, that's my moment of Zen. So it builds into my own well-being. If one day I have to drive, I'm kind of in a bad, bad mood because uh, my walk through Piedmont Park or my bike ride actually is refreshing. And so all these are actually have been very good changes to my life. These are not sacrifices at all, and I've reduced the, the, the you know, the my, my consumption of energy. I've increased my my well-being. So and and that's minor, right? That's that's a that's infinitesimal contribution, but. It's many of us. It adds up. It adds up, yeah. And you add, I know you well, fly. We all know that. I, I fly, and I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I fly. Uh, but I will tell you one thing I do when I fly, and I'd encourage you all, is to pack lighter, okay? Because by packing lighter and limiting what you bring, you save, you save fuel, and, and, and it's your way in which you can, can make It's not one thing. It's going to be a list of everything. And, to your question, Nick, is, is the world, does the world get it? I can speak from the business community. The business community does get it. In fact, the business community has always gotten it. It just hasn't been politically supported at times. You have an administration in there, and you have, I think, a, a world that largely supports it now politically and, and, and through governance, but also uh, through business. We've committed to getting to net zero by 2050 as a company. Uh, we don't we don't have the pathway. If we did, we'd we'd already be well on it. Um, everyone in our industry has has committed the same way, and I think industry broadly is largely on that on that same on that same goal. I'll give you. I, I, uh, Anhel talks about the circular you know economy. I mean, a, a beautiful thing for those of you that that fly um, in our premium products, going to going to uh, you're going back home to Spain. Say the next time you go and. You'll, you'll notice that your bedding and your comforter is made out of recycled plastic, 100% made out of recycled plastic, and that's all of our, our bedding. Is gone. We've eliminated, basically, plastics from, from our cabins as well as our airports and our lounges. Uh, huge, a huge statement uh, of electric vehicle. We're already aggressively implementing that. It was in Los Angeles yesterday, we opened up our new LA uh, terminal. Any of you going to LA? See it? It's it's, it's really. It's I just of, came back from LA. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's LA. A lot is a better hard, than it used to be. Yeah. It, yeah did you see the? the uh, I mean, when when we roll it out over the course of the next few months, you'll really start to see it come to life. But we have used that opportunity, just like in LaGuardia here in Atlanta, Seattle, Salt Lake, to 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 completely uh, modernize the entire fleet ground equipment in terms of electric usage. So there's many, 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 many things that we are doing. And so I'm, I'm optimistic. I share Angel's optimism that if you were to ask me now, do I know how I'm going to get 50% of the way there by 2050? But I know today, I say, I do. I do. And, mm -hmm. and that's pretty darn good from, you know, maybe five years ago, I would have scratched my head. We've got to figure out the last 50%. And, 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 and perfect is the enemy. Of, of, of progress right now. You're never, it, we're always going to try to get better, and we always need to continue to drive these incentives. If, one thing that, that, that I'll add is in terms of, of model, yes, to anybody who wants to write anything about biking to work, I'm like, yes, I'll be, <laughs> take my photo, take my video, 
anything I can do. The, the more people buy, the more. So one of the things we're doing at, at, at Georgia Tech in, in some of the, the, the people leading this work is we're now realize that perhaps one of the most important things we can do at Georgia Tech is to inspire that new generation, all those students who are now in our classrooms, who are gonna go on and, and join the ranks of, of Delta or Google, Microsoft, whatever, and make sure they, they get there with a different mindset. And that means thinking differently about our own buildings, about the spaces that, about our, our public spaces, thinking about our practices. Uh, we, just, we just opened um, a, a couple of years ago the most unbelievable building is not far from here. If you have time after this, you can all go the and, and watch building. it. They can eat a building. You've been there. <laughs> yeah. It's a striking uh, piece of architecture. It's a building. It's a living building, which is a huge standard to, to achieve. This building produces more en energy than, than it consumes. It processes its own water. It's, uh, it has this unbelievable canopy of, of, social, of, of solar panels. I mean, it has everything you can think of. It's an unbelievable well, let's just build a building, put in the classrooms, the labs, and, and, and now we're asking ourselves, no, no, how we can do it so that that building becomes an example. Still pains me, though, by the way, that all of our buses are diesel buses. Every time they drive, you just, ah! But uh, uh, <laughs> apparently they're like uh, supply chain issues. The electric buses are coming. So we, we want to get to here the, first. Uh, not to cut you off, I'm so sorry. Uh, we want to get to the audience questions. So thank you guys so much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you for your candid answers. We really appreciate that. Um, for those of you out in the audience who do have a question, please raise your hand and an Atlanta Press Club board member or staff member will bring you a microphone. Are we still gonna start with a question from, from Kelly here? Looking for guidance. Either way, uh, I'll leave it up to the APC staff member to bring you guys a, a microphone and we'll field some questions here. Uh, yeah, why don't we Kimberly, start? Kimberly. Yeah, why don't we start right here in the front? Kimberly, go for it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, two questions, two part question. Are we going to be able to make enough change in time? And um, second part of that is what can we do on an individual and media level or just on a community level to help break that inertia? So one um, uh, a colleague in my prior institution, I, I, I worked at George Mason University in, um, in, in Virginia, and, uh, and, and we had a, a colleague there who was an expert in climate change communications. Uh, he found one, one thing which I think was, was really interesting was um, at a time when no one believes what you hear in the news, we keep talking about climate change and people still think that, that it's, it's not true, and one of the most respected spokespeople for uh, where the, the news, to have the person in, insert commentary about climate change, and then you, you test afterwards, it is incredibly effective. So, um, so, so keep talking about, keep writing about, about climate change, keep, looking for different spokespeople who may actually be able to, to affect, because what, what's, what's essential again is that at least we as a society, we admit that this is a very important problem. Let's disagree as vehemently about what is the best solution. Let's, let's vote, let's argue, let's debate. But I mean, all the time we spend questioning the evidence is wasted precious time, so. I, I would say that the frustration I experience in, in Washington and many of us in the business community is that we're not really debating whether climate change is real, whether it's certainly not with this administration and, uh, and, and the business community you know, never really did. It's the priorities of an administration. You, know, you asked a good question, you know, Maria, to start. Is this number one important thing? And it's always hard to say it is the most important thing. But, it's by, it, but there's got to be a level of priority, and I think the, the build back agenda clearly got bogged down by the scale, the size, the aggregate size, not any of the individual piece parts as much as the overall size. And that's why going back around, I'm hopeful with a smaller bill that we'll actually start, start seeing some real progress made. 
takes a collective effort is what I'm gathering from all this. There was a question Mike in the- Mike Jordan? Yeah. Yeah, Mike, the, a mic for Mike. We know all these people. <laughs> yeah, he's on the board. Yes, as Maria said, I'm kind of cheating because I'm on the board, but either way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, climate solutions in the sense of environmental justice, um, and maybe it's a bridge that I'm trying to make here, but I'm trying to get to the idea of, in the sense of climate solutions and justice and charity beginning at home, I wonder what are some of the initiatives that Georgia Tech and also. Well, that's, uh, it's, it's a big question. Uh, you know, we are supporters of the Atlanta Public Schools. We've, we're, we're in there working hard. We're, we're training, training kids, reading the kids, doing everything we can. Um, I, it's, it's hard to draw the connection, candidly, at the moment, with, with you kind of getting it down to that level of detail at the grassroots level. Um, yeah, we, we, we clearly know where the bigger challenges lie, and they tend to be in the uh, underrepresented communities, you know, that don't have a voice where, where the bigger problems sit. Uh, at Delta, we have a, we have a huge, you know, uh, diversity uh, and inclusion uh, investment that we're making within our company, but also within our, within our community in many, many ways. And uh, our pandemic and what we've, we've uh, been through this last, couple of years hasn't stopped that investment. So we're active in the schools, we're active in the community at every level you're gonna, you're gonna see Delta. Uh, we, uh, your privileged communities, not just here in the US, and Atlanta, but around the world, are going to experience. So we, we have to really think as a global citizen, not just as a local citizen as well. I, I, I will add um, a lot of the, the, even some recent research in um, for my colleagues in, in, in public policy and economics, they're actually identifying a lot of areas where the effects of climate change are not uniform, even though we all suffer the consequences. Some people suffer more than others. I'll give you, I mean, just some small case, important though, I mean, even studies in, in LA, it turns out poorer neighborhoods have a much um, a sparser tree canopy, less shade gets a lot hotter. It increases the cost of your bill to cool your home. I mean, just a small example, but there's like, there are endless cases of, of uh, situations where, where climate affects different people differently. And so I think that the whole concept of, uh, of climate justice is a fair one. We, I, I try to take the, probably the, the leading uh, of, the, of the real issues and cases that our students are, are confronting and helping solve during that program is in the local community in cases very directly related to climate justice. Our last question will go right here. We have time for one more. Really quick question. Um, we've seen uh, corporates in Atlanta get together to support innovation, in particular around something like Engage, where you're investing directly in startups and providing those connections. Do you think we could do the same thing with climate and sustainability, where corporates get together and invest together to sort of meet ends that are greater than just the corporate needs? I, I think that's a great idea. And uh, you know, there's nothing stopping Engage from, from having a climate, a climate angle to it. But we're investors in Engage, and I think that's, that's it's, it's a coalition of the willing that we're, we're looking to create. And uh, I've told many, many folks, I mean, if, if you can figure out the, the overall way to start scaling sustainable aviation fuel and biofuel and uh, producing it uh, was private capital. And so that's where these opportunities would. Right now, there's, there's a lot of places you can find small, small uh, you know, corporate coalitions going after this, this topic. But you know, which one's going to, or two or three or five, are going to start to get scale? Well, it depend on which one the government's going to get behind, and then you'll start seeing real private capital, and that's when things are really going to take off. It's probably a couple of years away, but I, I see it. I see it happening. Uh, th um, just a terrific idea. We, um, I think, the director of our Strategic Energy Institute was here a minute ago, um, and we're trying to precisely build a coalition of businesses um, to, to to drive apply research, real like solutions driven research that answers specific problems that that the industry is facing. Um, but there's a, a ton of money to be made by smart entrepreneurs. 
I just mentioned the, the, uh, the case of our colleague uh, Gleb Yushin and, and their amazing uh, business case, who's probably one of the most successful spin-offs of uh, by a Georgia Tech faculty ever. Um, and think about if we had all uh, bought Tesla shares at some point early on. Uh, Center for Sustainability, um, Cheryl. Thank you. Can Thank you so very much. So thanks to the Atlanta Press Club. I guess I should take off my mask now. Sorry, I'm so used to this that <laughs> I don't notice I'm wearing it anymore. Um, for putting this event together. And uh, thank you so much to President Cabrera and Seal Bastian for your insightful comments. So as, um, as you heard today, there's a very important leadership role for business to take in um, creating the business models and adopting the technologies and materials that are going to address climate change and address it as quickly and effectively as possible. And as President Cabrera underlined, uh, there's a very, very important role for local solutions and local engagement as well. Uh, in fact, we're in it, not just at the federal level, but also locally, uh, who came together who launched, to launch the Drawdown Georgia Business Compact. And also, I'd like to uh, appreciate our partners, uh, nonprofit partners like South Face and the Partnership for Southern Equity, also for uh, being at the table for that. So, um, the work of the compact is meant to address um, collective action projects, um, to address innovation, to address the need to create a community of practice, and also to address the need to be transparent and to report on progress so that you know, our friends in the press can uh, hold us accountable and, uh, and also spread the good news, but also most importantly, ask, ask the hard questions. So I'm very optimistic that um, this compact is going to help greatly accelerate the uh, adoption of climate solutions in Georgia and that it will do so in a way that um, not only creates the jobs of the future, the careers of the future here in Georgia, but also advances equity and climate justice. Very important um, domains. If I, could, if I could have just a one or two minutes, I wanted to just get some highlights of the things that I heard. And it uh, seems like the world is aching, needing to find solutions. Uh, we can't walk away from here without healing the earth. Uh, read the climate change report, it's scary. It's happening right now. Uh, we have, we're in a pretty big mess, but optimistic we can rise to the challenge. There are big things we can do, small things we can do. And how can we capture carbon from the air? It's so exciting to explore some of this, um, the research that's there. Uh, have to focus on sustainable fuels and EV. Um, government needs to provide investment to this to solve some of these issues. Um, many companies are racing to net zero. It's become much more expensive to, to meet it. Um, we need to do in the sky what we've done with cars and on the ground. Um, business has a key role to play, a lot of solutions. It's not just technology, but the, um, we, the whole issue of Project Drawdown Georgia is an effort to bring these global issues close to home. We have lessons from the pandemic. We can have global collaboration. We are smart people. When we face a scary situation, we can rise to, to the challenge here. Um, and then ideas, ride a bike, pack lighter, do all these uh, things that you can do to make change. Um, perfect is the enemy of progress. Think differently about buildings, transportation. Imagine a better world. Meteorologists are connecting the impact of climate change uh, on the weather, and it's very effective when they do. Let's not. Let's not waste precious time. We are no, no longer debating whether climate change is real. Tree canopy, I can't agree with you more on that one. We, we need more trees. We need to not cut down the ones we have. Um, corporations should work together to invest in climate change solutions. There's a lot of money to be made. And when private capital gets involved, you'll really see change. Here, inspired. <laughs> and, and take more pictures of President Cabrera on his bike, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a 
reporter. I mean. <laughs> uh, we want to thank all of you guys here who showed up, our audience in person and online, and as well another applause here for President Cabrera and uh, Ed Bastian with yeah. Delta. Uh, and Atlanta Press Club would like to thank its sponsors, Delta Airlines, Drawdown Georgia, Business Compact, and the Southern Gas Company, as well as all who support the club annually. If you're interested in how you could support more, you can go to uh, thepressclub.org for information about upcoming events and how to join. I'm Nick Valencia, a very grateful moderator, grateful for this discussion, and to see so many faces here, it almost feels kind of normal. You did trigger me a little bit when talking about the <laughs> groceries being wiped down. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.